Antichrist. Now you can travel all over the world, but there are a few places outside of Italy on the face of planet Earth that you can visually see the immense influence that continues to be yielded by the Roman Catholic Church other than in South America. travel all over the world, but outside of Italy, there are a few places on the face of planet Earth that you can continue to visually see the immense influence that is yielded by the Roman Catholic Church, other than South America. Because in South America, some of the darkest chapters of the Roman Catholic Church were written in history, and it was written in blood. Because in places like Lima, Peru, where I'm standing, for instance, in the year 1570, the Peruvian Inquisition was set up. And the primary function of the Peruvian Inquisition was to prosecute as criminals those who were deemed to be heretics by the papacy. And in 9 out of 10 cases, heretics were simply Bible-believing Protestants. It's in places like this that Roman Catholic churches, they weren't simply citadels of worship. They were torture chambers of some of the most demonic forms of persecution that humanity has ever seen. So South America has some really rich and uh, intense history concerning the Roman Catholic Church. What would you say from your time here that's really unique about it all? Well, having grown up here, I've seen a lot of Spanish influence, having been to Spain and seeing a lot of the, the things that they brought from South America to Spain. Right. Um, I, it helped me connect the dots, but uh, in South America, some of the main centers they had was Lima, Peru, uh, Medellin, Colombia, where they formed the Spanish Inquisition. Right. And, uh, I visited the Inquisition there in uh, Lima many times, taking visitors. Uh, I also visited, um, took visitors to the San Francisco Cathedral, where all the catacombs and where all the dungeons are. They claim it's just a, a, just a cemetery for the, for the saints. 
but dungeons, dungeons with full of hundreds and hundreds of bodies inside. Right. You don't you don't bury the saints one on top of each other in a little dungeon like thing. I mean, but but I I now they don't you can't even go visit anything have it all closed off. But 30 years ago, I I could take my own flashlight and walk all the way through the, the things, and I did, and I I saw all of that. Uh, it's interesting that when they give those tours there through the Inquisition, they always tell tourists that that this was for the criminals. Well. I, I interrupted the young lady who was giving the tour. There was about a hundred tourists there, and I said, "Excuse me, uh, the Inquisition had nothing to do with criminals. It was all about religious uh, persuasion. Uh, if you were Inca, uh, pe local indigenous religion, if you were a Jew, or if you were Protestant, right. then you were subject to the Spanish Inquisition, and either you were killed or burned at the stake uh, somehow, tortured until you gave in and became a Catholic." And so. And so I said, uh, so why are you telling people this has to do with criminals? Criminals are those who steal and, uh, and those who uh, maybe murder. She said, well, that's true, that's true. This is not about that, but then why are you doing it? Because I was told, I was scripted to do this. I, they told me to say it. I said, but you're telling everybody lies. Ladies and gentlemen, I took over the tour at that time and I said, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, the Spanish Inquisition had nothing to do with criminal activity. It had everything to do with religious persuasion. The criminals were taken over to the civil courts this was only to torture and kill people who did not uh, belong to the Catholic Church. And she said, that's true, that's true, that's true. I said, well, please tell the truth in the future, you know, but then she would lose her job probably. In any case, uh, I saw all of that and I realized how, uh, if the Church has the ability to persecute, they will. book of Revelation, God himself identifies the existence of the system of the Roman Catholic Church and its nature, beginning in Revelation chapter 13, starting at verse 1. The Bible tells us, I, John, stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns, ten crowns, and upon its heads, the names of blasphemy. Now, a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a kingdom. This information is laid out clearly in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 2. The Bible tells us there, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by the night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. Then in verse 17 of the same chapter, the Bible says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Then in verse 23, the Bible declares, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So a beast in Bible prophecy simply is a kingdom. In more contemporary language, we would say a political power. And interestingly enough, in the book of Daniel chapter 7, there are four prophetic kingdoms identified as beasts that are displayed before us. The first one is a lion. It prophetically stood as a symbol of the kingdom of Babylon. The second one was a bear. It stood as a symbol of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. The third, a leopard. That stood as a symbol of the kingdom of Greece. And the fourth, a dreadful and terrible beast with teeth of iron, prophetically stood as a symbol of the kingdom of Rome. And what's particularly interesting about this prophetic beast, which is a kingdom, a political power, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse one, is that the Bible says that upon the heads of this beast, really pointing out the character of this kingdom, is the name blasphemy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, blasphemy is not a secular terminology that would be attributed to a kingdom, a civil power. Blasphemy 
is an ecclesiastical term. That's something that one would attribute to a religious power, a religious authority. Once again, helping us realize that indeed we're looking at in prophetic language, the unfolding of the Roman Catholic Church led out by its papacy, a system that unites church and state together. And in the Bible, blasphemy is defined as two things. Number one, in the book of Mark chapter two and verse seven, blasphemy is defined as a man professing that he has the ability to forgive other men of their sins. That's in Mark chapter two and verse seven. But then in John chapter 10 and verse 33, Blasphemy is defined as a man declaring that he himself is divine, he himself is God. He claims the prerogatives of the Almighty God for himself. And unfortunately, when you look in the Roman Catholic Church, you can see these principles firmly seated within that system. identifies this system as a beast that is actually an amalgamation of the other four beasts that we already looked at in the book of Daniel chapter 7 because we're told in Revelation 13 and verse 2 and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion there it is an amalgamation of all those other historic systems letting us know that the Roman Catholic Church the papacy has fused within itself the characteristic traits of these previous kingdoms identified as beasts in Daniel chapter 7. But when the word of God identifies the papacy, it says it primarily looks like unto a leopard, meaning it primarily reflects the characteristic traits of Greece. And in the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 21, one of the most notable characteristics of the Greeks is spoken of in the Bible, for we're told there, for all the Athenians and strangers that were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. The Greeks were known worldwide for philosophy, still till today. And it's interesting to note that the primary theologians that were responsible for constructing the theological belief system of the Roman Catholic Church, they were students of Aristotle and Plato. We're talking about Thomas Aquinas and the Bishop of Hippo. But there's something else that should really grab our attention that the Bible has to say about a leopard that's critical to our understanding of the nature of the papacy. Because in the book of Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23, the Bible says, Can an Ethiopian change his skin, or a leopard his spots? Then may ye learn to do good that are accustomed to do evil? It's impossible for a human being to change their nature, just as impossible as it is for an Ethiopian to change their pigmentation. It just isn't going to happen. The same way that it's impossible for a leopard to change his spotted coat. And God says that the papacy, primarily prophetically, is like unto a leopard. What God is simply trying to tell us is that Rome will never change. But is that true? Is it true that Rome never changes? Because in recent years, there have been a multitude of policies released by the papacy concerning their religious positions that would give the appearance that Rome has changed, or at least it appears as though. In the year 1530, 
Philip Melanchthon, one of the most noted champions of the Protestant Reformation, was responsible for penning a document which later became known as the Augsburg Confession. In this historic confession, he highlights the two prominent positions of Protestants that angered the Pope and all Papists to such an extent that they not only verbally denounced Protestants as heretics, but they literally waged war against their existence. Here is what Melanchthon had to say. The adversaries, meaning the papacy, condemned the doctrine taught in the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 20th articles of our confession, that believers obtain the remission of their sins through Christ by faith alone, without any merit of their own, and insolently reject these two tenets. First, that we deny that man can obtain remission of his sins through his own merit and secondly, that we hold, teach, and confess that no one is reconciled to God or obtains remission of his sins but through faith in Christ alone. It was through the teaching of these two tenets that the rage and fury of the papacy was directed towards all Protestantism because through these doctrines, the very core of the authority of the Roman Catholic Church was challenged. For instance, the teaching that believers obtain the remission of their sins through Christ by faith alone without any merit on their own part exposed the worthless nature of the selling of indulgences, which was a means by which the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church enriched themselves at the expense of the masses. And secondly, it also exposed the futile nature of the sacrament of penance, which according to Roman Catholic theology, is the act in which a priest of the church can declare a person absolved of their sins. But even after the priest pronounces that the penitent sinner is forgiven, according to the Catholic encyclopedia, there still remains an indebtedness to divine justice that must be canceled. And therefore, the confessor, which is the priest, will instruct the sinner to perform some type of penance, which is usually in the form of saying certain prayers or performing certain actions, such as visits to a church or visiting the stations of the cross, doing alms deeds, fasting, etc. And the works prescribed depend on the nature of the sin and the quality and extent of the penance is also determined by the priest. Most of these works can be done the very same day, but in other cases, for the sinner to have their debt canceled with God, they are required to do a work of penance over an extended period of time. This is clearly a system of justification based off of the merits of a man's works. And by using the doctrines of the Bible to contest these practices of the Roman Catholic Church, Protestants were directly contesting the authority of the Pope of Rome himself as a divine authority amongst men. And this caused a division between Protestants and Papists that appeared to be irreparable until recently. In the year 1999, on October the 31st, the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, in Augsburg, Germany, the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation signed a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. Within this document, the Roman Catholic Church, alongside the Protestant Lutheran Church, agreed that together we confess by grace alone in faith in Christ's saving work and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. This declaration of faith represents the most radical change in Roman Catholic theology that has ever been seen since this church's inception. So radical that based off of the signing of this document, apparently Protestants and Catholics now believe exactly alike. So alike 
that now many prominent Protestant leaders have been mounting the pulpits in their churches and declaring to their members that the protest of Protestantism is officially over. You have to admit it, superficially speaking at least, the papacy really does look like it's evolved into a new species, like Rome has changed. It's turned over a new leaf. But the only reason you would come to this conclusion is because you're really failing to take into consideration a very important aspect of the description of this apostate system that God presented to us in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. Yes, God primarily identifies the papacy as a leopard, but he also identifies this system as one that possesses a mouth of a lion. The very same lion that makes up the amalgamation of this apostate system that was first presented to us in Daniel chapter 7. And speaking of the mouth of that lion in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible says in Daniel 7 in verse 4, the first was like a lion and had the wings, wings of an eagle. I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given unto it. My friends, that line in Daniel chapter seven, it possesses the heart of a man. And in the book of Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse nine, the Bible tells us that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? No man can truly understand the depths of the deceptive nature of this satanic system known as the Roman Catholic Church. My friends, no matter how hard you try to search it out, only God himself can give us insight into the decrepit, depraved nature of this satanic system. Because Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The papacy will always say flowery things. It will always present itself as humble and meek and humanitarian. But we can't so much look at what the papacy says. We have to look at what the papacy and its popes do. On November 21st, 2016, seven years after the signing of the Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification by Catholics and Protestants, the Washington Post reported, Pope Francis gives all priests permission to forgive the grave sin of abortion. Before the year of mercy, abortion was in a class of sins considered crimes, which required a higher authority than a priest to absolve. A woman might have to confess her sins to a bishop, for example, rather than her parish priest. But on Sunday, prior to the release of this article, Pope Francis announced any Catholic priest can grant forgiveness to a woman who has had an abortion. This is, of course, a blatant act of blasphemy because in the book of Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible clearly declares, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? By itself, this act of blasphemy alone is sufficient to unmask the true nature of the papacy, but there's more. For instance, on June the 11th of 2017, AP News published an article entitled, Pope to Nigerian Priests, You'll Be Fired If You Don't Obey. The article opens with the statement, Pope Francis has laid down an ultimatum to defiant Nigerian priests, lose your job if you don't obey me and your bishop. He demanded that each priest in the diocese write to him asking forgiveness and clearly manifest total obedience to the Pope. They must also accept the bishop chosen by Rome. If within a month each priest doesn't do so, he will be ipso facto suspended, such as from the celebration of the sacraments, and will lose his current office, Pope Francis warned. This move on the part of the Pope reveals a blaring contradiction in what Rome says and what Rome actually does. Because not only is it an act of blasphemy for a man to command other men to yield their consciences to him in absolute obedience, 
which is a right that is reserved for God and God alone, but the reason the Pope threatened the Nigerian priests with the punishment of being suspended from taking part in the celebration of the sacraments is because, in Catholic theology, if you don't take part in the sacraments, you cannot be a part of the kingdom of heaven, which exposes the fact that although the Catholic Church signed a joint confession with the Protestants in 1999, confessing that they believe that acceptance with God is based upon faith in Christ and faith in Christ alone, in practice, they exhibit that they still hold to the falsehood that acceptance with God is based on being accepted by the so-called Holy Roman Church and the Pope of Rome himself. This is the first-hand experience from my, my, my dad. Um, my, my dad was finishing seminary uh, in Washington, D.C. at Tacoma Park. Before Andrews University was Emmanuel Missionary College. And, uh, and he was finishing seminary. He was standing there on the edge of the street. And a government inspector came up and, and then looked at him and said, uh, I just came from the National Shrine, the Basilica of the National Shrine. And he said, I don't know what to, what to say. He said, what I saw, I need, to, I need to tell somebody, I just came from there right now. And my dad said, well, tell me. And he said, well, I was an inspector. I was going to see if, if uh, indeed the, the building is ready to open. It took 80 years to build it, and it was about a 40-year mark at that time. And, and he said, I, I went to see if, uh, if it was safe to open it to the public. So I was inspecting it, and uh, I was uh, ready to, to open it, but I needed to see something. I saw a big door right there, and I said, I wonder what's down, what's there? And he said, uh, that is the that is the basement, and he said, "I want to go down there." But there was two big gates, and he said, "Well, you could, we don't take people down." No, if I'm going to sign off the sign off the permit, I have to see the basement. So reluctantly, they opened it up, and he went down. And lo and behold, there was some big, massive doors there, red doors. And he said, "I want you to open them." And he tried his best to get around it, but finally he said, "Unless you do it, I won't sign it." Wow. So they opened them up, and there was three tiers of cells. I mean, like a big, full three stories of prison cells. And he was shocked. He goes, "A modern cathedral with prison cells in the basement?" Wow. He said, "What in the world would a cathedral have prison cells for?" And he said, "Are you Catholic?" He said, "No, I'm a Protestant." Well, then it's not in your business," wow. said the, the priest. Just inspect it. Is it safe or not safe? <laughs> and so he didn't know, but he came back and he told my dad all of this stuff. And then a couple of days later, he talked to my his cousin, who was a contractor, and he was delivering cement to the to the basilica. And and then a big truck pulled in and started offloading these big heavy boxes down into. You know how they put these boards and they send them around. Like on those rollers, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. just straight mm -hmm. down to the bottom, right? And he was doing this, and they offloaded 99 boxes while he was offloading the cement. And the very last box is like it was meant to be. They dropped it, and it broke at his feet, and all the machine guns came out. Well, wow. that's two first-hand wow. stories from my family about the Basilica. So it's full. They have machine guns stored down there and, and prison cells. Well, having, heard, having heard this story all my life from my dad and first-hand, it happened that when I was 19 years old and graduating from College Dell Academy, we decided to do a senior class trip to Washington, D.C. Right. At this point, I had no thoughts of that issue. But, but once we got there, we went to see several things in Washington. There's a lot to see, museums and so on. Okay. But then one night, we stayed at a hotel, and we watched All the President's Men, which is a story of the Watergate scandal <laughs> right. with Richard Nixon. And there was a lot of investigation and people looking around. And, and so I, I said, hey, guys, this reminds me. Here in Washington tomorrow, we're going to go to the National Shrine. Uh, I told them the story, you want to go investigate? It's only halfway done. It's only been 40 years ago. Uh, actually, it was only 19 years ago. I was, I was a baby. Right, right. Uh, you know, it was 40 years ago since then. But anyway, uh, they said, yes, yes, yes. Well, we, we went and we, we went into the official tour. Right. And then we're showing this is this room and this is the prayer room. And then she was going through all the different things. And we hung back, hoping that we could just kind of disappear out the side. But boy, she had evil eyes. <laughs> and she kept saying, boys, boys, boys. And every time we tried to hang back, she'd go. I said, we gotta do something more aggressive. There were some big curtains hanging along both sides. And so we, next time she turns around, we ducked in behind the curtains and we stood there. We thought they were just against the walls, but we found a whole new world behind the curtains. It was like, they were just there to hide the new construction that was, wow. that, that was going on in the back. Okay, right, okay. And so, and so we, uh, we uh, uh, 
went investigating, we found all kinds of things in it. That can be computer rooms. Uh, we found a bathroom that had no window in it, but just an empty hole, and we threw a rock down in time that we'd taken physics, and we calculated it was 200 feet deep, <laughs> and down to the bottom of the basement. Where, and, and so we did all of this, and we talked to the employees that were back there. None of them spoke English. They all spoke Spanish. They were from Spain. They were illegally there, uh, from what I could tell. Uh, and basically, they said, either we obey or they ship us back home and deal with us. <laughs> you know? and, so, and so we were able to talk. Since I speak Spanish, I was able to talk to them and, and ask them about the doors that go to the basement. They said, oh, yeah, we know where they are. They're right down the hall there on the right. You'll find the two big double gates. And I said, have you ever been down? Oh, they wouldn't let us down there. Do you know anybody who's been down? Yeah, the cardinal, he has, he, he's the one who, only the people from the Vatican. So we said, I wonder only why. Vatican only people. the Vatican people were downstairs. Okay. And so I said, how can we find the cardinal? We were getting more courageous. We thought we could go <laughs> talk to the cardinal himself, you know. And so they said, his office is across at the diocese, across the, the street. So we went across the street, and uh, they opened the door and said, no, speak English. And so I said, oh, I speak Spanish. Oh, then come in, come in. So he let us in. He showed us the office of the cardinal. We went around. They showed us everything. He said, I'm sorry, he's traveling right now. Listen, we want to get the key to the to the basement how can we get the key oh he always keeps it right there on his belt he doesn't let go of it for a second he always has it there so he's the only one that, he's the only one only people from the vatican so they confirmed the story wow. and i said okay well who else could we talk to he, he said well the superintendent is back in the cathedral upstairs right on the back ask for father so and so so we went around and asked for him he came out he was very friendly he was willing to chat with us and so we told him a little bit about the background now no details told him that the, the, inspect, the government inspector had talked to my father and, and had gone down. And he, said, he was very surprised at what he saw. And he said, he, he started getting intrigued. He goes, well, what did he see? I said, well, <laughs> just to make sure the story is correct, why don't I tell you a few things and you tell me the rest of it? Okay. Uh, two big red doors, very tall doors, prison cells. Hmm. I said, yes, sir. Wow. And then complete the rest of the story. A hundred big boxes, big, filled with machine guns. <laughs> I said, wow. right on target. Wow. And he goes, well, you guys, what are you doing here? Checking all this stuff out? I bet you think all these pillars are empty. I said, no, we don't think they are. We know they are. I said, we, we've gone up some of the stairs. We've, we've been checked out the whole building. Well, how in the world did you go throughout this whole building? Uh, n we got instructions from your workers. No, they don't speak English. Yeah, but I, you hablo español. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, he goes, oh, you speak Spanish, so you could talk to them. Yeah, we talked to them. They were all helpful. But of course, if you don't speak Spanish, you can't talk to anybody. And so, he said, who are you? Where do you come from? I'm sorry, sir, we have to leave at this point. <laughs> it was only the stupidity of teenagers, you know, but, but it confirmed right. that what, we, what he, my dad had heard was correct because he helped us complete the, the picture. That's and right. he confirmed that. Now, the, really, the impact of this whole thing is, what would a modern cathedral be doing building prison cells right. and having machine guns. I thought it was about peace. I thought it was about God. I th that's what they say. Mm -hmm. But behind the thing, that we, the Bible tells us in Revelation that all these things will be repeated again. And the great controversy confirms with detail that even in the recesses of these new buildings, mm -hmm. they are planning and building to repeat the same atrocities that happened in the Middle Ages. So you have the belief that Rome and I say Rome, I'm talking about the system, not yeah, the people not the itself, people. but yeah. the Roman Catholic Church. Correct. It really hasn't changed. It's the same entity it was in the Dark Ages. I believe it when they say Rome never changes. Okay. So when they say that, and I've confirmed that they don't change. It's like I told you. You can't listen to what the papacy and its Pope say. You have to observe and observe closely what the papacy and its popes do because God already forewarned us that the papacy would speak peace but it would really mean destruction because in the book of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25 the scriptures declare concerning the papal power led out by the pope and through its policies it shall cause craft which means deception to prosper in its hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and through peace he shall destroy many this system according to the word of god would develop a multitude of policies policies that would make the world very comfortable with its existence policies that would make the politicians of the world bow down at the footstool of the pope of rome policies that would make the Protestants of our world say, you know what, 
the protest is over. We need to come together in ecumenical union with the papacy, with the Roman Catholic Church. They're changed, but they're laughing at you. They're laughing at all of us because all the while, as they're humbling themselves, trying to gain your allegiance, they are seeking to magnify themselves in their heart. Because as the politicians and the Protestants of our world seek to unite once again with the papacy, they are looking to gain the power and authority they once had in their possession during the dark ages that they might ascend the seat of global primacy. And through all their messages of peace, billions of our world will be destroyed because instead of being hidden in Jesus Christ in these last days, they will fall for Satan's last great deceptions. My friends, our only hope is to believe the word of God. No matter what men say, no matter what men may even do, we must believe the word of God because the word of God is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. It is the more sure word of prophecy where unto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place. God is trying to reveal to us what is going on within the dark quarters of the Vatican. Because Rome has many faces, but the God of heaven, he never changes. And Jesus says in the book of Revelation chapter three and verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee in the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the face of the earth. My hope for you, my prayer for you, is that you will look to the word of God as your strength right now. And you will ask God to teach you his will right now and to give you power to stand in the crisis hours that are right before us. Because only those that stand upon the truth will weather the storm. As always, this is the forerunner. And whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth.